we'll move on to the next lecture uh, the second presentation by young forum it's on dyslipidemia decoded next first after maithilya aravindan senior registrar in internal medicine professorial medical unit national hospital of sri I'll just move to my talk. So I'll start my talk about Mr. D. So Mr. D thinks dyslipidemia is so overrated. Dyslipidemia isn't it all about reducing LDL? Every year they bring down the LDL target. In fact, they say apoly, apoB, and lipoprotein A, and not non-HDL. So many terms. Aren't they all the same? Or should I care? At the end of the day, isn't it about starting a bit of statin? Uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so Dr. D, sorry, Mr. D was thinking that this lipidemia isn't it so overrated? Isn't it all about reducing LDL and uh, ever reducing targets? And then so many terms, all of which look more or less the same. And isn't it about uh, starting with a statin? Uh, but then wait, doctors are already using a lot of statins. And I know that statins cause muscle toxicity and liver toxicity and dementia and whatnot. So I should probably be warning the patients ahead. Who is Mr. D? Mr. D is most of us doctors before this talk. Let's see if it's so. So to state the obvious, we know coronary artery disease is the number one killer, including in Sri Lanka. And we know it's driven by the bad cholesterol, the LDL, which takes cholesterol to the atherosclerotic plaques and the good cholesterol HDL, which removes it from there. But is that all? But at the end of the day, aren't the HDLs, LDLs, they're all in the bloodstream. Can't they all go into the subintima and give some cholesterol for the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque? Because HDL are too small, they don't get trapped in the subintima. They can move all the way up to the adventitia. So they don't release a lot of cholesterol in the subintima, even if they are carrying cholesterol. Whereas other molecules like LDL, the lipoprotein A's and IDLs are trapped in the subintima because of their size and release cholesterol for the buildup of atherosclerotic plaques. Whereas chylomicrons and large VLDLs are too large so that they are usually uh, not uh, getting access into the intima. So then is it is it only LDL and IDLs that are bad? Are triglycerides safe? Not really. Triglycerides release some of their lipids through lipoprotein lipase and become these remnant molecules, which in turn can get access to the subintima and then release cholesterol to the atherosclerotic plaque. It's not just that. When you have a lot of triglyceride during this process, a lot of free fatty acids are released. And we all know free, free fatty acids are the derivers of adipose tissue inflammation and the metabolic syndrome. So how bad is dyslipidemia as, as a cardiovascular risk factor? Having a high LDL, and low HDL is as bad as smoking and diabetes in uh, the causation of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So in that case, then should we start thinking about lowering LDL? So if you can see in this study, the curve above shows, these are from observational studies. They are we think about people from Mendelian studies who anyways had genetically lower cholesterol. That is what is shown in the above curve. And the other curve represents all the therapeutic studies where we have tried to bring down the LDL cholesterol. So what you can see here is for the same level of cholesterol reduction shown in the x-axis, those who anyways had lower cholesterol from LDL from birth have about three times better reduction in atherosclerotic cardiovascular outcome. So earlier you have a lower LDL, the better is what we know at this point. So if that's the case, isn't dyslipidemia a case of the rest? And how about us? How bad are our lipid profiles? So we know from this, uh, Kaplan et al. have published in 2005-06 that four out of five Sri Lankans have some form of dyslipidemia. Half the population have low HDL. And in fact, this seems to be a population phenomenon. It is there across all age groups. Half the population have high LDL which is in fact the predominant problem in the mid and old age groups. And one part of the population has high triglycerides. So it's in fact a problem of us. In that case, when should we screen ourselves for dyslipidemia? All apparently healthy adults 
uh, age 35 and above should screen themselves for dyslipidemia. Does that mean some of us here are safe? Not really. Even the persons aged between 20 to 34 years, if they have any of these risk factors, they are also supposed to get a, a lipid screen. But if I'm a non-smoking teetotaler and has the leanest of the body, body habitus, still there is no escape because history of diabetes mellitus in the first degree relative, which all of us are having, makes us all uh, at risk and we have to screen ourselves for dyslipidemia. So having said that, how do we screen for dyslipidemia? A standard lipid profile. What does a standard lipid profile contain? It has triglycerides, total cholesterol, and the HDL cholesterols, all of which are directly measured from somebody's serum. And the other parameter is a non-HDL cholesterol, which is actually derived by deducting the HDL cholesterol from the total cholesterol. And the other all-important parameter, which we always talk about, is the LDL cholesterol, which is also a derivation. You deduct the estimated BLDL cholesterol and the HDL from the total cholesterol, and thereby you can arrive at your LDL. So how do we estimate the VLDL cholesterol? It's roughly one fifth of your total triglycerides, right? So that is how a standard lipid profile is produced. So then when should I send the lipid profile? Right now or tomorrow morning after fasting? What is the difference between non-fasting and fasting lipid profiles? So what happens in a non-fasting lipid profile as compared to a fasting lipid profile is you get a lot of chylomicrons so or intestine derived lipoproteins with triglycerides entering into your serum, which are found in the non-fasting lipid profile. So how does it uh, matter? This can result in a slight increase in the triglyceride level compared to a fasting sample and a reduction in the total cholesterol and the LDL compared to a fasting sample. But then, although there is such a difference, is it relevant to fast or not to fast? We have evidence from multiple studies that non-fasting lipid profiles are as good as fasting lipid profiles to predict the risk of coronary artery disease as well as to monitor the efficacy of lipid lowering therapy. In fact, it has been used in some of the landmark trials as well. But there's an exception. In case you have a lot of triglyceride, triglyceride level is more than 400. And we already spoke that LDL is a derivative in the lipid profile and the VLDL estimate is one-fifth of the tot total triglyceride level. So in case you had a lot of triglycerides, this VLDL estimate is also going to be high. And therefore, there, there could be underreporting of the LDL estimate. So in that situation, you might have to go for a fasting lipid profile where you have a lot of triglycerides. So then what is considered abnormal? Uh, these are the standard values. Triglycerides more than 150 milligrams. Total cholesterol more than 200. HDL less than 40 for males and less than 50 for females. And LDL, of course, it depends on your cardiovascular risk, but generally less than 100 is considered optimal. It's not just that. We also have the non-HDL cholesterol, which optimally should be less than 130 milligram. So why so much talk about the non-HDL cholesterol? What are these non-HDL cholesterols? So if you take the total cholesterol, everything excluding the HDL, accounts for non-HDL cholesterol, which includes the LDLs, lipoprotein A, IDLs, and the DLDLs. Mind you, a vast majority of this is represented by LDL. That's why most of the studies uh, still talk a lot about LDL targets, because out of the non-HDL, a vast majority is LDL. However, again, if the triglyceride is more than 150 milligrams per deciliter, but then your lipid profile is not showing a lot of LDL, then you should think about the non-HDL cholesterol. Why? I'm so sorry, you can't see half the picture. Now, if you take two people who have the same amount of non-HDL cholesterol, the amount of VLDL they have and the LDL they have could be different because it all depends on the state of cholesterol transfer between VLDL and LDL. Now, for example, at a given time, a patient could be having a lot of their cholesterol in the LDL molecule. And another, and another person could be having a lot of cholesterol in their VLDL. So for a patient who apparently has a low LDL, could at that point be having a lot of function of the cholesterol ester transferase and the rest are in the VLDL. So in this sort of a scenario, apparently they seem to be having a low LDL. But if you take the non-HDL cholesterol, it's higher. So in fact, they are at higher risk of ischemic heart disease. So Cholesterol transfer state determines that, but this again becomes a problem.
leaf you have a lot of that is that will be represented in your triglyceride level so in that scenario non hdl cholesterol than your ldl cholesterol that is especially true in diabetes because we know diabetes causes significant hypertriglyceridemia what is apoB level? ApoB are all the lipoproteins that contain an ApoB molecule, which again are all of these non-HDL molecules. As opposed to HDL, which is an ApoA lipoprotein, all of these are ApoB lipoproteins. So then, I just showed the same diagram a while ago when I was talking about non-HDL cholesterol. So then, is ApoB... Thank you, sir. So uh, then, are ApoB level and not, aren't they the same? I was just showing the same diagram uh, when I was talking about non HDL cholesterol as well. Why? Now, when you take the LDL cholesterol, what we talk about as LDL cholesterol is the amount of cholesterol. Whereas, what we talk about ApoB is the number of lipoprotein particles that have ApoB. So, why is it important? For in a patient who has the same amount of LDL cholesterol, one person could be having a lot of ApoB containing particles and another patient could be having less ApoB containing particles. And as we all know, small dense LDL or small uh, LDL particles are more atherogenic than the larger ones. So in th this instance, if you might be two patients might be ha maybe having same LDL. But the one with more ApoB is again at more risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We do have evidence for that. This may be the reason is what they postulate. So what we have seen it at a given LDL level, South Asians are more of cardiovascular disease than Caucasians. This could be the reason. But then, uh, at least from the Caucasian studies, they have found that as a rough marker, non-HDL cholesterol is good as good as ApoB. But it might not be the case for us uh, because of the fact that I just read uh, about. But what is the difference? Non-HDL is just a derivative from a standard lipid profile and it comes at no additional cost. Whereas if we want more ApoB level, it comes at an additional cost. So you will have to consider this in case of diabetics, those with metabolic syndrome. Those are seemingly having high risk, but their LDL levels are low. Then you consider doing this. Right. So now, as I go along in my talk, I would uh, discuss with you about these aspects of the dyslipidemia therapeutics. And I would uh, also comment on how we are performing in the Sri Lankan setting, optimal, acceptable, or could be better. So how are we doing with regard to screening for dyslipidemia? We're doing reasonably well. In fact, we have an NCD control program, which uh, aims to screen all eligible adults for dyslipidemia in the MOH clinics itself. Then after we find the, uh, do a screening lipid profile and find your whatever LDL and HDL level, what is the next step? We have to find out the 10-year cardiovascular risk. Some people have already done the hard work and we have calibrated risk charts for Sri Lankans, the WHO charts. How do you use it? You have to find out whether they are diabetics or not. You have to find out whether they are, I mean, the, choose the men's chart or the women's chart. And then in that, you have to choose the smoker or non-smoker chart and then find the appropriate column, sorry, the row that belongs to their age. And in that particular row, you find the intersection between their cholesterol level and the systolic blood pressure. That gives their 10-year cardiovascular risk estimate. But there are some risk modifiers. This chart, as you can see, start is calibrated for those age 40 years and older. So what do we do for those less than 40 years? You can calculate that the four, at the 40 to 44 year tire because overestimation is better than no estimation. And then it also underestimates the risk in those with all of these risk factors. Commentable ones are obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and family history of cardiovascular disease. But then we don't need to uh, do any risk estimate if you already have cardiovascular disease. If you have diabetes with renal disease, or you have CKD stage 3 due to any illness, uh, or familiar hypercholesterolemia, because all of these conditions, by default, are considered very high risk and warrant uh, treatment with uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, medication. So then, what is this? What is this coronary calcium score? But what, what do we exactly try to do there? So as we know, atherosclerosis or atheroma is an inflammatory process, and it causes dystrophic calcification. So what we try to check the coronary calcium score is to check how much atheroma burden is there. 
but it's a long standing process and therefore you can only do it uh, reliably in those more than 40 years of age. And what is the clinical utility? When you have calculated the LDL and you have put, applied it to the WHO risk stratification chart and some person uh, comes into the intermediate risk and you're unsure whether to treat or not, then you can do a coronary calcium score. If the calcium score is more than 100, regardless of anything, you'll have to start treatment. If the score is zero, it's reasonable to withhold and monitor. But if it's between 1 to 99, it should be an individualized decision. What so is lipoprotein A? Is it a totally new uh, lipoprotein? No, it's just another LDL molecule that has an APOA particle attached to it, which makes it more atherogenic and more prothrombotic. But it's genetically determined. It is not influenced by what you eat or the environmental factors. So once in a lifetime assessment is enough to predict your risk based on the lipoprotein A levels. The sad news is statins will not reduce lipoprotein. You can just predict the risk but statins, or, statins won't reduce the risk. But we have new agents like PCSK9 inhibitors, which are shown to reduce the lipoprotein A levels as well. But there's no convincing evidence yet for primary prevention, but there's emerging evidence for secondary prevention uh, through reduction of lipoprotein A by PCSK9 inhibitors. So then, based on all of these, you have to find out the treatment threshold for these patients for which we categorize patients into several risk groups. For example, somebody is considered at extreme risk of ASCVD if they have already had a atherosclerotic cardiovascular event on treatment and are now coming with a recurrent event. They're considered at very high risk if they have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It could be clinical disease or imaging proven disease. Also, diabetics with multiple risk factors, those with CKD stages four and five, familial hypercholesterolemia with any other risk factor, and the risk chart is predicting very high risk. They would be high risk if they have just single markedly elevated risk factor or diabetics with just one risk factor, uh, CKD stage 3, anybody with familial hypercholesterolemia and a 20 to 30 percent 10-year risk. Moderate risk is basically anybody with diabetes and the 10-year risk of 10 to 20 percent. Low risk would be those who have estimated 10-year risk of less than 10%. So, are we doing enough in risk stratification of our patients? Probably not, because we have evidence to say that there is an unmet need for statin therapy in those with low to intermediate risk category. Chai Singh et al. in 2018 have shown when you take a number of statin-indicated patients, only 26% were on the recommended dose of statin and only uh, about 25% were not treated with any statin at all. This is probably because we are not risk stratifying the low to intermediate risk category appropriately. So then after we risk stratify, how do you treat? For example, if somebody is stratified as having low risk, even if they are low risk, if the LDL cholesterol is more than 190, we are supposed to start treatment. And either with drug therapy or lifestyle, it's better to bring their cholesterol down to less than 116. If somebody has moderate risk, you're supposed to bring the LDL to less than 100. If it's high risk to less than 70, if it's very high risk to less than 55, and in extreme high risk patients to less than 40. That is where we stand at the moment. And mind you, there are ongoing studies about lower the LDL, big the better. So is it only the LDL cholesterol? We also have non-HDL cholesterol targets, which are roughly about 30 milligram more than the LDL cholesterol. And then we have the APOB targets, which are about 10 milligram per deciliter more than the LDL targets. And it's not just that. In those with high risk, it's not just the value. You are supposed to bring the LDL by 50% from the baseline as well. It's both, not either of those. It's both, 50% and to the uh, desired target. Because... If you can see in this study, the red lines dotted and the continuous indicate patients who have achieved an LDL target of less than 70, whereas the blue line indicates patients who have achieved an LDL target of less than 100. So um, even in those who have achieved an LDL target of less than 70, you can see the continuous line that depicts those who have achieved less than 50% as well as less than 70 are performing much better than those who didn't achieve the 50% reduction. So then the next step would be to discuss the targets with the patient. How are we doing in that? The prescriber is often probably aware, I assume, but we don't often discuss that with our patients. 
Then after you identify their risk status and once you make the decision to treat, firstly, you have to exclude the common secondary causes for LDL cholesterol elevation as well as triglyceride, the common of which are like hypothyroidism, alcohol, and some of the medications. How are we doing with regard to that? The conditions probably, yes, we often do thyroid functions and screen for diabetes and so on, but we might not be paying enough attention to the medication, especially over-the-counter medications might be overlooked, like the anabolic steroids and the contraceptive pills. Right, so now having done all that, we decide to start therapy, starting statin. What statin should we start, which is more efficacious? What do we have as evidence? Benefit of statins is a class effect. No one statin has been shown to be more efficacious than the other. It's uh, related to the achieved LDL reduction. The benefit is a class effect. So there's therapeutic equivalence at comparable doses. Uh, thereby, we classify them as high-intensity statins, which reduces LDL by about 50%, moderate-intensity statins, which reduce LDL by about 30 to 49, and low-intensity, less than 30%. So how do you initiate? As I mentioned earlier, in these two risk categories, who has already had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you go for high intensity statin, which according to the national guidelines of Sri Lanka is ATOVA around 40 milligram and ROSUA statin around 20 milligram. In the other group, high risk as for primary prevention, you give moderate intensity statin, that is ATOVA around 20, ROSUA around 10 milligram. And the rest of the people, we have started our low to moderate intensity statin. Are we doing this enough about starting statin therapy? Actually, we are doing very well, at least in cases of secondary prevention. How do I say that? We have the landmark AXLAB, Acute Coronary Syndrome Audit Project by Galapathy et al. in 2018, which showed that 91% of all our patients with acute coronary syndrome are discharged on statin. This is quite comparable to the MINA UK uh, Acute Coronary Syndrome Audit Project, where they are discharging about 97% on statin. Uh, so now if we are starting statin so much, how about statins? Are they very safe drugs? Uh, so what are the adverse events of statins? From whatever trials available, what do we know? Do statins cause all of these? The meta-analysis says that statins have significant increase in odds ratio for new incidence of diabetes and elevated ALT and ASD. The trials have not shown that it causes very significant increased risk for uh, prominent elevation in um, so creatinine kinase compared to controls. Uh, new incident diabetes is common as with Roswell statin, elevation in liver enzymes with ATOVA and lower statin. Although overall there is no increase odds ratio, simvastatin subgroup has shown slight increase in creatinine kinase levels. Is this the same for primary prevention? Again, in primary prevention, there is only a significant increase in odds ratio for muscle-related symptoms complained by the patients and not really for muscle disorders evidenced by elevation in the CPK. Uh, liver dysfunction, definitely yes. And not, although we say renal dis insufficiency, I'll talk about what it is. It's not exactly renal insufficiency. But those are trials with controls compared to controls, uh, that is placebo or whatever standard of care. Statins are not at increased risk of many of the other postulated side effects. However, when you compare intense therapy versus moderate dose statins, they do cause a higher risk of liver enzyme problems and elevation in the cyclophosphamide. But these are the odds ratio that I'm talking about. Talking about the exact incidence, statin in induced muscle symptoms occur in up to 25% of patients. These are symptoms. But statin induced muscle disorder only occur in 2 per thousand or less. And statin induced liver enzyme detainment only occur in less than 2% of patients. So this made the scientists thing as to what is happening exactly. So they collected a, a group of patients who had stopped statin due to various muscle-related symptoms. And some of these patients were not started on anything. Some of them were started on a placebo and the others were started on statin. And surprisingly, what they found is about 90% of the symptom burden that was elicited by re-challenging the statin was elicit, uh, elicited by re-challenging the placebo as well. This brings in the concept of nocebo effect of statins. What is a nocebo effect? It's a harm that the patient experiences, but that is because of the result of expectation of harm. So is it because the patients are reading too much or the physicians are warning too much that statins can cause a lot of muscle problems? So how do we manage statin-related muscle problems when a patient comes with muscle symptoms? If it's just mild to moderate, you can even continue 
and address this nocebo effect. Tell them about the good effects uh, rather than the bad side effects. And then you can always rechallenge. You can rechallenge with another statin. You can start a lower dose, or you can give at least once or twice per week. And then if that is also not tolerable, you go for non-statin therapy. But if they have severe problems, you have to discontinue, uh, which might be occurring rarely, including the rhabdomyolysis, myositis, severe myalgia, autoimmune myopathy, and myopathy. And you're not supposed to do a routine screening for uh, creatinine kinase. How about the other adverse effects? Statins do cause a bit of elevation in liver enzymes, but that is limited to elevation in liver enzymes. True hepatotoxicity, liver dysfunction, and liver failure are exceedingly rare. New onset diabetes mellitus, yes, there is some increase, which is more prominent important, with more potent dose and more in elderly, but the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. Increases of ICH, the evidence is inconclusive, and again, clearly benefit outweigh the risk. Uh, renal function, it's actually not a renal dysfunction. Statins have neither beneficial effect or any risk in the renal disease progression itself. However, they cause a proteinuria, which is of tibial origin and is completely reversible. So what do we do next? Now we know statins are quite safe drugs. We have started statins along with lifestyle modification. But if the goal is not reached, you are supposed to intensify statin dose. If not, add something like acetamide. If not, you're supposed to add something like a new agent, PCSK9 inhibitors. Bioelastic sequestrants can be considered. So it is this step that is concerning. Are we are all we are starting statins in all our patients, or at least most of our patients, but are we intensifying the therapy to achieve the goal? So there is a therapeutic inertia to intensify statin dose in Sri Lanka. So in this trial, they have shown only 43% of diabetes patients have achieved an LDL cholesterol of less than 100. And Vijay Kron et al. in 2019 have shown only 13% of uh, patients, clinic patients, achieved LDL targets. Why? Because prescribers rarely give more than 40 mg of atorvastatin and more than 20 mg of rosuvastatin because of the fear of all these potential toxicity. Uh, but few available observational studies have failed to show any increase in the adverse event with increasing doses. But mind you, whatever studies available in Sri Lanka have also only used 5 to 40 milligrams of statin, not beyond that. But then there is again another uh, point. There is also evidence that at a given statin dose, South Asians achieve much better serum concentration than the Caucasians. Whether this will translate into better efficacy or better or a higher risk of adverse effects, we don't know. It's not studied. So if statins are again, doubtful in, the, in that regard, how do we then achieve the LDL targets? We have new agents, the common of which is acetamide, which inhibits cholesterol absorption from the intestine, and then the PCSK9 inhibitors, which inhibit LDL receptors being internalized, that is, they en enhance the LDL uptake, and the new ones like benpiroic acid and the infliciran. I won't go into details. We are at least looking at 10 to 15 years from today that they are going to be available for our use. So, because acetamide is available in Sri Lanka, and that is, of course, the next line, I will tell some words about acetamide. It can be used as a combination with statin or PCSK9 inhibitors. There are already fixed-dose combination pills available with simvastatin. It has a long half-life, therefore, the dose is about 10 mg once daily. It can be used as monotherapy also, if the patient is really intolerant to statin. But the problem is, if the statin intolerance was due to muscle symptoms, there are studies that say acetamide also rarely cause uh, rhabdomyolysis. If the problem was liver enzyme elevation, acetamide also causes elevation in liver enzyme and is contraindicated in moderate to severe liver disease. And if the problem was pregnancy, acetamide is also a category C um, drug in pregnancy. Common side effects are basically like flu-like symptoms with body aches, headache, and fatigue. So uh, that's about uh, high LDL. If the patient has associated hypertriglyceridemia, what do we do? If it's less than 100, lifestyle management is good enough. If it's up 200 to 500, still, although they have high triglyceride, statin is the first line, and you're supposed to achieve the LDL target first. If not, after achieving the LDL target, you can add something like the icosapent ethyl. If the LD triglyceride is more than 500, that is an one instance where you can start initiating fibrates for the control of triglycerides. So what is new in the management of dyslipidemia? It's possibly the combination therapy. Now, for example, if you take this Mr. S, 58-year-old man who has diabetes, hypertension, and a recent anterior STEMI, 
and we do a lipid profile and he has a very high total cholesterol and LDL, something like 259. So now from all these, we know because he has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, his target is less than 55 and 50% 50 reduction. Let's say we give the best of the statin, the high intensity statin. What we can accept best is 50% reduction in the LDL. That would make his LDL 129, which is not good enough. So let's say we add acetamide to this. That will cause another 20% reduction in the LDL, bringing down to 103, which is also according to the guideline is not good enough. So there, there is a role for PCSK9 inhibitor, which will show another 50% reduction in LDL, probably be helpful to bring him down to the goal. So uh, this is one reduction with various combinations therapies. You can even achieve up to 85% reduction from the baseline. Uh, again, there is evidence for this. Compared to high-intensity statin, moderate-intensity statin in combination with acetamide, whatever evidence is there is that is non-inferior with regard to the composite endpoints, but more patients achieve the LDL cholesterol targets and with lower uh, level of drug intolerance and side effects. So this is probably a time for change. You have to maximize the lipid lowering therapy from the beginning. Consider combination therapy at least in very high risk patients. So is combination therapy the game changer in the management of dyslipidemia? If so, how about us? How about the availability and the cost that we have to bear? So uh, probably what we can go for is what is called the TLC therapy. What is a TLC therapy? So much for the, all the discussion about uh, dyslipidemia and the LDL. What are we going to do when we get out of this hall? We're going to have this and then go to the ward and be very stressed about all the number of admissions. And then because we are stressed, we go to go and binge watch Netflix and we don't sleep. Instead, if we ate this and then be happy with what we do at workplace, and then we did this when we went home and had a good night's sleep, that is TLC, the therapeutic lifestyle change, which can uh, achieve a 20 to 50% reduction of uh, your targeted LDL. This is quite comparable to high intensity statin, which is also 50%. So with, that, with uh, that note, ladies and gentlemen, this is the game changer of dyslipidemia therapy. And I take this opportunity to thank all my trainers, colleagues, and patients who made me uh, who I am. Thank you. Uh, few questions, Yes, Dr. Now, if you can bring down the cholesterol to your target levels, do you go home and eat and you can break it? If you can, uh, if uh, if you can bring down the LDL with, uh, without side effects of statin therapy, uh, I would still okay. say uh, you uh, go I'm for the uh, BD uh, whatever uh, healthy uh, diet because it's not just cholesterol that you're talking about. There is hypertension and other risk factors which have to be addressed. Because whenever I see a patient with cholesterol, the wife behind him says that they are going to the over there and in the cell. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Mayathri. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mayathri. Please accept the certificate of appreciation.